President Gertler, Chancellor Wilson, President Robbins, distinguished guests of the convocation, the professors and administrators and staff of U of T who are present here today, and of course, most importantly, the University of Toronto, Victoria College graduating class of 2016, and families. Congratulations to all of you, and thank you so much. That was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> it's a real privilege and honor, and such a pleasure to be here back at the University of Toronto, this magnificent educational institution in this magnificent city of Canada on this grand occasion of your graduation. It's all the more meaningful to me because I consider this to be a coming back home. I was born just down the road from here in Hamilton. <laughs> and my mother, who's here today, taught even closer down the road at York University. I actually moved to the United States at a very young age before I went to school. So I never really got to say I went to school in Canada. Until now, kind of. <laughs> I'm so happy now to join all of you in saying I have a degree from the University of Toronto. It really feels like my life has come full circle, coming back here to Toronto in that way. But actually, it's come full circle twice in just a, full, in just a few months. Because I came back to Toronto just a few months ago in September for somewhat different reasons that some of you will already know, uh, but which I'll explain shortly. One reason that I'm happy to be back here is that all my life, I've been a great fan of the liberal arts. Uh, and the University of Toronto, of course, has been a model in Canada of the liberal arts philosophy, giving students the opportunity to learn about many different fields of human endeavor so that they can enjoy and apply these varied fields to their lives. One never knows how a field that one learns might end up being used in one's life. And for me, that's happened on more than one occasion. My interest in mathematics actually rose in large part due to my early interests in language, in poetry, in music. I loved patterns in languages and in music. I loved looking for palindromes and spoonerisms. I loved composing sentences that didn't use the letter E. <laughs> if you've never tried that, I highly encourage it. <laughs> it's pretty hard, but fun. Uh, I enjoy that, generally the acrobatics of poetry. And of, and of composing. And in particular, I loved the rhythms of Indian music. I always hate to say this in front of students, but you're all graduating, uh, that I never liked school. <laughs> 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 and so I actually used to take off many months from grade school <laughs> uh, and just go off to visit my grandparents in Jaipur, India. Uh, and I used to study there Sanskrit poetry with my grandfather. I used to study accounting and Hindi from my grandmother. And I used to study classical Indian music uh, from my family and from various teachers there. My favorite instrument uh, was the tabla, uh, which is the most commonly used percussion instrument uh, in classical Indian music. It has very intricate finger uh, melodic rhythms, uh, which I loved. Uh, I loved experimenting with those. I loved experimenting with frequencies uh, of melodies and music. How do we choose the notes that sound good to us uh, in various cultures? And what I discovered is that the choice of frequencies that one uses in music is entirely governed by beautiful mathematical principles. And so despite all my interests in language and music and poetry, what I realized is that it was in large part the artistic, mathematical aspects of all these subjects, of language, poetry, melody, rhythm, that drew me to them. And the art of mathematics became a true passion for me, in addition to the subjects that are more traditionally classified as arts, such as language, poetry, and music. To me, mathematics was just another variation uh, of those arts. Now, mathematics is usually taught in school as a science. Uh, and so most people never get to learn 
certainly not in school. One of the reasons I didn't like school so much. <laughs> uh, we don't normally get to learn in school that math is really a similarly creative subject as other arts, and that math has really historically played an important role in the development of the arts and the humanities. And that's how I personally got hooked to mathematics. And ever since that happened to me, it's been one of my goals uh, as an educator to get more young people into mathematics, not just through the sciences, but also through the arts and the humanities. My courses at Princeton frequently deal with language and mathematics, with poetry and mathematics, with music and mathematics, and what's been the most popular recently, magic and mathematics. <laughs> now, my mother being a mathematician too, she was glad that I came around to seeing mathematics as my subject. Uh, and being from India, she told me when I was a child the story of one of the great national heroes of India. Srinivasa Ramanujan. Ramanujan was born in poverty and without a formal college education, he pursued his passion for mathematics. And he pursued it as an art form, which made him a hero to me as well. He went on, despite his poverty and his lack of education, he went on to revolutionize mathematics, leaving us with hundreds of beautiful formulas that we're still trying to understand today. I still spend some of my time looking at his notebooks trying to decipher further lines from his notebooks. Uh, as a child, Ramanujan had discovered trigonometry on his own and was kind of disappointed later on when he saw that people already knew it in school. <laughs> and that's something that happened to him many times over his life. In the 1990s, the author Robert Canigal wrote a best-selling biography of Ramanujan. And I was truly inspired by the story. It had everything. It had a person who overcame seemingly insurmountable odds, to pursue their passion and leave a lasting impact on the world. It had a testing romance. It had personal tensions with his English collaborator and friend. India was under English colonial rule at the time when Ramanujan was in India. So it had everything. It had triumph, it had heartbreak, it had glory, tragedy, and much, much more. This was an amazing story. And I remember being immensely inspired by the story, both at a personal level, his mathematics and his dedication to his art, but also at a global level and as an educator. His story highlighted the importance of universal education. Education from all people, from the smallest villages to the big cities, so that no talent in the world would be left behind. So I thought his story has to be brought to the screen, at the big screen, as a film. But I also thought, well, I'm not a filmmaker, I'm just a mathematician. <laughs> And so that was just a dream. A decade went by, I became a professional mathematician working in much the same area as Ramanujan. And I enjoyed it immensely. I had forgotten about those earlier dreams of filmmaking. And then I got a call. It was from a Hollywood scriptwriter who wanted to write a script about Ramanujan. He said he had heard about my interest in writing and the liberal arts. And of course, my interest in the mathematical work of Ramanujan. Would I be willing to help with the script? Of course, I said yes. <laughs> that was one of my childhood dreams. It would be an honor. I worked on that for a couple of years, but unfortunately, that movie never came to be. That happens. <laughs> you see, there are some difficulties in Hollywood in having such a story. First of all, having a non-white non -white lead actor that was strike one. The fact that he was a mathematician. <laughs> that was strike two. <laughs> but strike three was kind of interesting. The mathematician in question was an actual real person, not the usual caricature of a mathematician. That is, he wasn't socially awkward, largely mad, scribbling formulas like a robot. <laughs> and that ironically made it even a harder sell. <laughs> It's very tough to overcome stereotypes in Hollywood. That's what I learned. It was very hard to convince investors, who in turn claimed that it would be hard to convince audiences that a math mathematician could also be a very normal and pleasant person. <laughs> in addition, and in order to compensate for him being Indian as the lead actor, at least a couple of iterations of the script had investors offering funding for the film. 
if we could kindly agree to have Ramanujan have an affair with a white nurse. <laughs> this way they could suitably cast an English actress and have a lead white character that way. For reasons of accuracy and authenticity, we decided to decline those offers, <laughs> but persevered with the true story, which we believed was going to be much more inspiring, much more surprising, actually, than the fake ones. Well, it took three directors and another decade before that happened. But the film, The Man Who Knew Infinity, finally became a reality just a few months ago. <laughs> Dave Patel, a slumdog millionaire, plays Ramanujan, and Academy Award winner Jeremy Irons plays his Cambridge collaborator, Hardy. It's a real testament to them that they came in on such a low-budget film, given that we couldn't find investors, as I mentioned before. Also, Dave would have been too young a decade ago. <laughs> so that kind of worked out. <laughs> Matt Brown is the writer of the film, and the legendary Ed Pressman, who has produced over 75 films, is the producer. I served as an associate producer on the film as well, along with another mathematician and Ramanujan expert, Ken Ono. It was a passion project for all of us, and a real joy for all of us to bring it to completion. And the film had its world premiere, amazingly enough. This is why I was saying this is my second homecoming in the year. The film had its world premiere at the Toronto film, International Film Festival in September, where it was selected as one of the large gala presentations of the festival. So I got to come back home, come back full circle to Toronto to celebrate after that 10-year project. The Man Who Knew Infinity has just been released to theaters worldwide with, with very heartwarming acclaim from audiences. And in particular, it's come to Toronto. So I hope you will get to see it. And it's in theaters now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from, aside from plugging the film, <laughs> the point I wanted to make here <laughs> is that you never know where life will take you, what opportunities it might present to you, or how you might be able to use what you've learned, sometimes in completely unexpected realms. I never imagined as a child that poetry and music and language would take me into mathematics. And then a decade ago, that my mathematics and general liberal arts training would lead me into experiences of filmmaking, which in turn actually would help me in my long-term goals of spreading the word about universal education. And this is why I urge all of you to pursue your core, pa your core passions. But in addition, always enjoy and give importance to other subjects and endeavors as well. In addition to enriching you as a person, you never know when these subjects and lessons might turn up in your life in a big way, or even turn out to be related to your main endeavors. In short, you never know what opportunities and experiences life will throw at you. And so the main advice that I would have for you today is to be open, open to learning new fields, new endeavors, as you have throughout your education here so that you can take full advantage of those opportunities and experiences when they come. I believe the wonderful liberal arts educations you've received here at the University of Toronto ideally prepare you and enable you to do exactly that. So not just find jobs, but beyond that, to do inspired work, to find and enjoy and learn about new realms and discover those unexpected connections among different realms of human endeavor so that they facilitate your experiences, your new experiences that may be unexpected when they come upon you. And you can use your experiences to continue to have fun with these subjects, to make new friends and cherish old ones as well, to take care of your family and friends and others, and of course, in general, to do good work for the world. So congratulations again, class of 2016. I can't wait to hear about what you all will do. In the future, best wishes for a most exciting array of future endeavors. 
Thank you so much.